a little bit more meat on the bone, so to speak. Joining us in Singapore is Miss Kavita Prakashmani, the CEO of Mandai Nature. Fantastic to have you with us. I think you're perfect to moderate this discussion. Thank you so much. Our panelists online waiting so patiently in the wings. We have Professor Kolian Pin, the director at the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions at the National University of Singapore. We have Ms. Huo Lo, the deputy director of corporate engagement at TNC China Program. We have Ms. Felia Salim, the board member at and Green Fund and Indonesia Exim Bank. And Mr. Martin Walder, the founding partner at Pollen Nation Group. Thank you so much for your time. Ms. Kavita, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Very excited to be talking about nature-based solutions in Asia, one of the biggest opportunities we have to address climate change. But before I introduce myself or even the panel, we wanted to take a minute to make you do a pop quiz. So we have a single question for you on ecosperity.live just to get everyone into the mind space of nature-based solutions. So if I can ask everyone in the room to go to ecosperity.live and everyone online as well. And the question is very simple. In 2030, what is the estimated nature-based solutions for climate contribution towards climate mitigation? 10%, 25%, 33%. So we leave that question going so that you can have a bit of time to log on and think about it. And I will try to not give the answer away in my opening comments, but we will get to it uh, through the talk. So while you do that, a quick introduction. My name is Kavita Prakashmani. I'm the CEO of Mandai Nature, which is a new environmental NGO set up here in Singapore, but focusing on Asia. We're backed by Temasek and Wildlife Reserve Singapore, and we're really focused on nature conservation, including wildlife, habitats, and working with people, but also on climate change and how we can bring nature and climate change together. I'm really delighted to be here to be moderating this very distinguished panel. We have heard through yesterday and this morning how net zero commitments are being made by 124 countries, thousands of companies. Everyone is on this trajectory to halve their emissions by 2030 and go to net zero by 2050. But actually, no one knows really how to get there. So we're hoping with this panel to give you some sense of at least what nature can provide as solutions to climate change. How do we invest in nature? What kind of investment can be made? What is the science behind some of that investment? And how do we actually start looking at making the business case for companies, people like yourselves, to make that investment? So quickly, let's look at where the poll result is. So if you can have those results on screen. Wow, so we do have the majority of people, and we can see the numbers going up, guessing correctly. It's 33%. A third of the solutions for climate come from nature. So we really do need to focus very much on how we create those solutions so that we have win-wins for nature and climate. So yes, we need to up the estimate for the people who guessed 10 and 25% to really be focusing on a third. Thank you. I am now going to go and kick off the panel with a few slides that I wanted to share just to set the context for all of us. So what we are looking at from the nature-based solutions that we have is how they fit in. We know we have to get to halve by 2030 and net zero by 2050. We will have to reduce all our emissions across the board using the mitigation hierarchy for companies. And when we have reduced as much as we can, we will still have a gap to get to net zero. So what can nature-based solutions do? Nature-based solutions can help you reduce that, for example, by stopping deforestation in your supply chains. But it can also help fill the gap that remains through offsets, which might be through more uh, reforestation, restoration, agroforestry, so that we're actually sequestering more carbon to fill that gap. Where does that come from? So we now know it's a third of our emissions are, can be sequestered or reduced or avoided through nature. So basically, we can either protect them. So, and it's not just around forests, though we do talk a lot about tropical forest. 
peatlands, wetlands, grasslands. In fact, grasslands can sequester even more than tropical forests often. We can manage them sustainably. So we heard about how agriculture has a big role to play. It's one of the biggest drivers of deforestation. Better management of croplands, better management of uh, pastures. And of course, we can restore them. We have lost so much of our ecosystems that bringing them back, not just simply planting trees, but restoring the entire ecosystem to be functional is one of the other big ways that we can bring that uh, restoration. We need to recognize that people are as connected to nature and nature and people are connected to climate change. It goes around. We cannot pick one or the other. Having a climate solution at the cost of nature or not benefiting people does not make for sustainable solutions. So we as civil society are really pushing for that link to be very clearly understood and measured and articulated. Many examples exist. So we've been doing nature conservation for decades now as environmental NGOs, as local communities, indigenous peoples, and even as, as companies and governments. But there are a number of challenges that still exist. How do we get better investment? How do we get any investment into actually project development, not just buying of the credits? How do we make sure that carbon is priced in a way that we have the true cost of what it takes to deliver these nature-based solutions? How do we make sure we have the regulations that support some of these nature-based solutions to, to come on board? And of course, the quintessential, how do we measure? How do we ensure permanence? How do we ensure additionality? I'm not going to give you the answers. We have a whole panel here that is much more expert in this than I am, and I am going to turn directly on to them uh, to get us going. So let me start by introducing our first speaker, uh, who has already been mentioned by the Deputy Prime Minister, Professor Colian Pin. He's the director of the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions at National University of Singapore. Professor Ko has 16 years of international research in sustainability and environmental sciences, working across Switzerland, Australia, and the United States. Most recently, he was the Vice President for Science Partnerships and Innovation at Conservation International. We are delighted that in 2020 he came back uh, under the National Research Foundation's returning Singaporean scientists to set up this new center at NUS to inform us with cutting-edge science strategies and actions for Singapore and Asia-Pacific. He's highly cited conservation scientist from Asia, a TED Global Speaker, Director of ConservationDrones.org, and a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader, as well as recently nominated member of parliament here in Singapore. Dr. Ko, over to you to take us through just a few slides on the science of nature-based solutions. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for the kind introduction, Kavita. Uh, very good to see you today. I'm actually uh, serving my SHM from my hotel just across the water, so it's pity I can't be there in person. Um, but I very much enjoy your introduction to the subject matter. And uh, I'd like to echo your, your views and, and say that uh, nature-based solutions are not only important, but they are also an integral part of, of our solution set. Uh, in fact, um, they are baked into every IPCC pathway for us to achieve the Paris Climate Goal. In, in other words, even if we manage to decarbonize, uh, we may still fall short of our targets unless we also figure out the science and the practice of implementing these nature-based solutions. Now, at the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions at NUS, my fellow scientists and I work closely with both the public and private sectors to address the most urgent science and knowledge gaps for us to improve the evidence base uh, that helps to inform our policies and business decisions on climate strategies and actions. Uh, for example, one of the first questions we tackled was on the issue of scale. What is the scale of the problem versus the scale of our solutions? And we know that global carbon emissions is currently at about 40 billion tons of CO2 per year. Our research shows that by protecting threatened forests across the tropics, we can avoid the loss of almost 2 billion tons of CO2 per year. And this is greater than the emissions of Indonesia and Singapore combined. Our research also shows that by protecting threatened mangrove forests alone, 
we can avoid the loss of some 3 million tons of CO2 per year. And furthermore, we find that there are almost 11 million hectares of urban green spaces worldwide that are potentially available for reforestation. And if we manage to reforest these green spaces within our cities, they could contribute to carbon capture at a rate of approximately 80 million tons of CO2 per year at the global level. And next slide, please. Now, from the perspective of a policymaker or investor, uh, it may not be enough to know what the potential of nature-based climate solutions is. Uh, they also need to know where the potential lies. And so we also produced a series of carbon prospecting maps to show where in the world can one invest in forest protection to avoid the most carbon emissions. Now looking at this map, we see that much of the potential lies in South America and Southeast Asia, our part of the world. In fact, Indonesia and Malaysia are among the top five countries in the world where we can avoid the most carbon emissions by protecting uh, their forests. Next slide, please. Now, on this other map, we show that the financial return on investment from these nature-based carbon projects can be quite substantial too. And based on very conservative carbon pricing scenarios, we find that Asia Pacific has the highest concentration of the most profitable carbon projects, which can generate return on investment at close to 25 billion US dollars in net present value per year, every year, for the next 30 years. Indonesia alone can generate about 10 billion US dollars per year, again, every year for the next 30 years. I think I'll stop here and uh, I look forward to our discussions later. Thank you, Lian Pen. Lots of questions are going to come your way, so we'll hold on those while we get through our other panelists. Um, I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, Huo Li, who is the D Deputy Director for Corporate Engagement and the Nature Conservancy China program, joining us from China. Uh, she's responsible for strategic engagement with business leaders and seeking transformational solutions through nature-based climate solutions. She used to be the uh, Director of Climate Change and Energy at TNC China and led the strategy for NCS and drove cooperation with academia and think tanks. She has 10 years of experience in the field of climate change and resilience, worked across Switzerland, UK, Canada, Australia, and before TNC, she was the National Program Officer at the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. She is also the co-author for TNC's first publication on nature-based climate solutions and has been engaged in writing for various research reports on the topic. Delighted to have you here and happy to hear your thoughts. Uh, thank you, Kavita. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's really a great honor for me to be here. Um, so I, you know, um, I would like to share more importantly part like how to do NCS. I I know like probably a lot of experts, you know, uh, speakers, they mentioned about what is NCS. So for TNC, we have a number of uh, uh, on ground experience. So uh, I would love, like to share with you more. Uh, today. So the first slides, just uh, trying to echo what uh, be mentioned by um, Kavita, that you can see, uh, you know, like uh, what uh, means, what we means for NCS. So for TNC, uh, we define all the actions that is to protect, uh, improve the management, and restore the three classical ecosystem. This kind of actions are all called NCS. So here, the ecosystem you can see is not only refers to forest, but also wetland or cropland, including grassland as well. Mm. Of course, they have potential mitigation, uh, contribute to mitigation potentials, which has been mentioned by uh, many experts. Next slide. So let's see how to do. 
Uh, just now, Professor Ko gave you the whole pictures uh, based on the AP level. But for us, you know, uh, TNC, uh, in 19, uh, 2017, we did a global research trying to uh, pre estimate uh, all the pr priority pathway. So these slides will give you a snapshot, like, you know, what it looks like. Here you can see under the three classical ecosystem, there were 20, in total 20 priority pathway that can contribute to the global uh, emission target uh, before 2030. So among this, you can also notice that some of the actions uh, with the dark blue bar, for example, avoided forest conversion, or you know uh, the uh, natural forest management, uh, or uh, conservation agriculture, these kinds of actions are the top priority pathway, so that can guide the practitioners, uh, policymakers, and also the, the uh, financial investors if they want to do something on NCS. Uh, next slide. As for TNC, uh, as I mentioned, we have more than 70 years experience on ground. We did a lot of restoration program globally and in China. So for example, in America, uh, we have the global, uh, we, we call it a family forest uh, carbon uh, platform so that we build up some piloting or learning sites for the local community to show them how to do the uh, natural forest management. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, in America, we also established the, re, you know, the regenerative agriculture platform uh, in, the, uh, in order to protect the soil health and also uh, to generate soil carbon. So these slides just to show you some pictures we took in China. So the bottom line on the left is from Inner Mongolia. So here we doing the grassland management through improved grazing uh, uh, practice. And on the right part is the water program we carried out in Zhejiang. So in order to improve the quality, water quality for downstream, uh, users. So we work with different stakeholders trying to do this and also make sure all the stakeholders can benefit from that. Uh, move to the next slide, thank you. So here is some of the take away, take away message. Um, so when we're talking about the NCS, uh, we think it's not only refers to re uh, forest, it also concern uh, wetland or grassland, cropland as well. Uh, and the third point uh, I want to highlight that uh, although NCS has very critical roles in achieving carbon neutrality, but you know it cannot uh, be a replacement for the other mitigation solution. So for NCS, we believe it can be taken as a low regret uh, actions to tackle climate change. The last um, but not the least, NCS can uh, also you know. Uh, not can cannot only be used to fix uh, emission, but also can cut emission. So they can contribute quite a lot to deal with the methane or the NO2 comes from uh, our crop land or the livestock farming. So thank you. I I would like to you know spend more discussion uh, with everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Holi. And I think just to emphasize the point that these are not a replacement for companies and countries reducing their emission or avoiding emission. This is an additionality should be the last resort in the mitigation hierarchy. So thank you for bringing that up and sharing some practical examples. Uh, I'm going to move us to our third speaker and very delighted to have uh, Filia Salim join us uh, from Indonesia. Uh, Filia is the board member of And Green Fund and Indonesia Exim Bank. Uh, she has 35 years of experience in finance and banking, including as the managing director of the Jakarta Stock Exchange and the vice CEO of uh, PT Bank Nagra Indonesia. She's also a member of the board of the Indonesian Exim Bank, as I mentioned, and on the audit committee of PT Whale Indonesia. Uh, from the conservation and climate side, uh, Ms. Salim has been really engaged in the sustainability space, including being a member of HSBC's Climate Advisory Panel, uh, Board of Directors of the Anne Green Fund, the Climate and Land Use Alliance, the Blue Abadi Fund, uh, and Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, which is more on the nutrition side. She's been instrumental in establishing several key organizations, such as the Partnership for Governance Reform in Indonesia, 
the Transparency International Indonesia, and the TIFA Foundation. So very warm welcome to, to you, Philia, and over to you for some of your comments. Thank you very much, Kavita, for the kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here and to share with you uh, the, a business case uh, uh, for the nature-based um, climate solutions. Um, we are pretty much convinced that there is obviously the financing return, as Professor Ko has indicated. Uh, but in, in this business case, we also want to show that it's obviously it, it also uh, we're looking at the investment philosophy, whereby um, in order to uh, uh, to look at the climate solutions uh, land use base, we look at the return on environment as well as the return on social inclusion to ensure the sustainable community development uh, surrounding the areas where we invest uh, is, is also uh, benefiting. And uh, for, from these three returns, return on investment, return on environment, and return on social inclusion, uh, the N Green Fund is a special purpose capital and hoping to, uh, to leverage other funders to participate. So we have already invested in from the capital farm in Brazil and in Indonesia in the palm oil and so in the Congo Basin, but um, um, this is one, one example that I'd like to share with you. Um, I would like to uh, show you some of the tools uh, of, of how to arrive in how to get these returns. Uh, next slide, please, Kavita. Thank you. So um, the three main principles that we look at is we look at the no deforestation, no, pe no exploitation policy. Uh, this has to be pre-agreed with the willing partner within the corporate and the financiers. And another one is the uh, ESAP, the Environmental and Social Action Plan, which is really uh, uh, following the IFC performance standards. And the third one is a landscape protection plan, which we develop with the client together and, and the other stakeholders around the area. This is, this is not, not something like your conventional banker would understand doing, but so that's why there's so many other stakeholders involved um, you know, scientists, community organizers, uh, NGOs, uh, in, in support of this, uh, looking at this at this ecosystem. So NDPE, ESAP, and uh, Landscape Protection Plan. And last slide. I'd like to show you that that this has obviously has to 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 be measurable. So for the environmental return, for example, we've invested in this 130 million. Uh, project of which N Green finances about 30 million of it. Uh, we normally finance 20 to 25 percent of, of the project. And when we agreed on this, we agreed on some 80,000 80, 8, hectares of forest conserved with the concessions. It, it all it varies, you know. Sometimes it's avoided deforestation, sometimes it involves reforestation as uh, you know, at your opening remarks, Kavita. So, so it really not one size fits all. We really need to uh, 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 work with the companies on the ground and look at the environment um, and, and it's a stakeholder surrounding it. So, and, and the key point here is the sustainable intensification of the, the land use that we use. So, um, so avoiding ex, um, you know, expansion of land use. So that, that's the whole idea. So that it has to be uh, productive land. And of course, we look at the social inclusion. In this case, for Dhamma Satya Nusantara, we look at the 8,000 smallholder farmers. And, um, and we calculate also how many individuals can be affected from it. It's 11,000 individuals. So let me tell you that working together with experts in how to uh, uh, facilitate the smallholders to have better farming practices, better seeds, uh, um, high quality inputs, training, and of course, the basic finance, right? And of course, eventually the sustainable sourcing, uh, the NDPE implementation will also go throughout the supply chain, right? So for, for this uh, company in particular, um, the NDPE, we, we give them time, you know, they, they, set the, they set the commitment and we give them time to, to, uh, to prepare. So by 2025, more or less, they're, they're going to be ready for uh, NDPE certified. And, and for 
you know, uh, and this is also helping them uh, to get certification for the RSPO, uh, maybe another two years down the line. So it's the pre-commitment, the pre-agreed commitment from, from this willing partner, as, as I call it. So um, this is a good model. Now they are looking to uh, raise uh, uh, funding, uh, further funding for, for their projects, leveraging this experience with that, with us. Thank you. Thank you, Philia, and thank you for highlighting a few important points that I'll call out. One about how these uh, efforts can be part of value chains of companies and link in into the deforestation agenda that has been much more grounded and settled within the company commitments and to bring in the social inclusion at a landscape level. So very important points about how you create on the ground solutions that are long term standing and have the commitment uh, to make happen. Uh, I'm moving us on to, to Martin Wilder, uh, last but not the least, and we'll talk about a very important thing about how do we actually get investment into these kind of projects. Martin is the founding partner of the Pollination Group, which has really been set up to move funds into nature-based solutions. He has a background in economics and law and has been very focused on the transition to net zero while preserving natural ecosystems. Uh, Martin has retained over many years the accolade of the world's leading climate change lawyer and the star individual by Chambers Global Law Guide. He was head of uh, Baker and McKinsey's Global Climate Law and Finance Practice, uh, chair of the Australia Renewable Energy Agency, former founding director of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, uh, as well as helping establish and chair the federal government's Low Carbon Australia Finance Body. He's currently president of WWF Australia and chair of the NSW Climate Change Council, uh, while also holding an adjunct professor position at the International Climate Change Law at Australian University, National University. Uh, Martin was awarded the Australian honor for his contribution to climate change law and the environment, and also the winner of the 2018 Financial Times Asia Pacific Legal Innovator of the Year. So no pressure, Martin, you have all of these various hats. So talk to us about what would it take to get investment, uh, the right investment at the right level into these solutions. We can't hear uh, first of all, thanks very much for the kind introduction. Thanks very much for um, having me today. Um, I think as the speakers before have articulated very well, we are facing this sort of twin crisis of climate and nature. And I think if you just go to the next slide, what I really want to talk about here is that in order to, we've heard a lot in the last few months about the need to drive trillions of dollars into nature. So at the, uh, at the Biodiversity Convention, I think the figure put on 77 trillion um, in the in the in in the Igos Perry report that's come out again, the figure is very high. So there's a recognition of the need to drive very large amounts of capital into nature. So what that the challenge to date though is that in order to do that, we're sort of tinkering at the edges. So carbon is the proxy for investing in nature. So when you talk about soil carbon, it's really generating carbon revenue through doing soil activity, or it's through tinkering with supply chains, or it's doing very important projects. Um, as we've been hearing about today, but those projects will not drive the $77 trillion that we need. And so what we need to do is have a completely different approach to nature. And I think today, when we look at, at sort of new financial mechanisms or new ways of doing things, what we've tended to do is to look at how do you finance nature through the more traditional lens. So we think about undertaking those, those existing economic activities like farming and agriculture and forestry in a more sustainable manner. Um, and so they have less impact or they can create additional biodiversity benefits. But again, that, that is, I would argue, more at the fringes. We look at a lot of issues around debt for nature swaps, which are also very important instruments. For many countries that are in significant debt, those will not move, move the dial because it will not free up sufficient capital to invest in nature. And the challenge for many of the least developing countries is where they do allocate national parks or they try to protect areas, they simply don't have the resources to do so. So it's a significant challenge. So we need to have a little bit of a new way of thinking. And I think part of the challenge also is that we just simply don't value nature in the way that, that the more traditional economic and more destructive um, uh, um, activities that will destroy nature do have an economic value. So if you're talking about protecting a rainforest area versus palm oil, um, you know, historically the palm oil has always won because of the economic imbalance. Um, also the incentives that we have are wrong. 
Well, so at the moment, if you're a country that has traditionally protected red and forests, the challenge that you have is that you don't get rewarded for that. If you're a country that has its forests at threat because you've been, been logging, then you do get rewarded for that. So we need to revisit some of these incentives that we've had along the way and work out um, how we change that. So I think, so a couple of suggestions I'd like to make about how, how we do that at a global level. The first is that we need to think of nature as the world's critical infrastructure, that it holds the economy together and we need to be able to place a value on doing that. Now, unfortunately, um, unless there's more aggressive regulation around forcing people to protect nature, that, 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 that value doesn't come. And again, the, the default proxy ha has really been carbon. Um, so what are some ways that we can do that? And I'm going to propose some more, I guess, maybe radical ideas here that I think we need to be thinking about. So the first is that um, we've always talked about the risk, the, the risk adjusted cost of capital. So increasingly, there's, a, there's an idea that if you're talking about climate change, you talk about the climate risk adjusted cost of capital. And you've seen many of the banks now are not financing coal power stations because of the fact that they have a significant climate risk. So we should apply the same test to, to nature risk. If a major investment, which a multilateral development bank is doing or a, or a pension fund is doing or an institution is doing, has a significant climate risk, it should, simply should not be invested in. And we need to start looking at, at, at nature through that lens. A second thing is, 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 is simply lending. So a lot of the banks have ruled out areas where they no longer lend to, uh, particularly in a climate lens. So again, how do we move this across to nature? How do we rule out investing in those activities that really do detriment nature? And we need to stop thinking about offsetting nature because while we can offset with carbon offsets, if you destroy one piece of critical biodiversity, you simply cannot replace it with another offset. So this then brings me to a third idea, which we've been sort of floating around, which is this idea of, of companies and finance institutions being required to build nature banks. So in the same way that under the Basel Convention, uh, when the Basel Conventions were introduced, there was a need for companies to have a minimal capital adequacy to ensure the financial system was stable. We should start looking at how do we apply a similar sort of thinking to nature. How do you require finance institutions and governments and banks um, and corporates that want to protect, that, that, that want to interact in the natural, in the, in the global economy to require them to have set aside a certain amount, amount of, of natural capital in nature banks around the world. So these are ideas that we need to move towards backed by regulation to try to put a significant value on nature so that we can make it actually investable. We just come to the last slide. So, 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 so when we look at investing in nature, and again, this is, it, it is not, a, we need to create an asset class off the back of what I just said that is in fact recognized as a new asset class. Now again, carbon has been recognized as an asset class, but there are a lot of interesting dynamics when you're investing in nature that will drive investment. And I think um, uh, one of the interesting uh, comments that was made before about mapping carbon projects in countries, we can identify where um, there are key physical um, opportunities to invest in nature, but what we need to overlay on top of that is what is, is how the governments approach nature. So what's interesting is that in certain countries, like Indonesia at the moment, they are passing legislation that price carbon to what other countries are pricing legislation that, 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 that prices and values nature. So what are the regulatory frameworks within a particular country that will drive investment into nature? Who owns nature? How are the assets structured? What's the, what's the ability to invest in them? How do you transfer the value of those assets? How do you ensure that the value trickles down to communities? So these are all issues that you need to do when you're doing due diligence on nature investments. But ultimately, we need to have a far more aggressive regulatory approach to protecting nature, to valuing nature, and to driving the $77 trillion of money that we want into, in, 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 into the natural capital base that we, so, uh, uh, we know we need to protect. Thank you. Uh, and I think I'm just going to highlight two of the points that you made. One is that we need to value nature. Currently, the only aspect of nature that's been valued is carbon. And hopefully that the market will pick up at some point to then value the other parts of nature um, as, as well. And the role of regulation, absolutely critical for us to be ensuring that we do have a really clear regulatory framework that enables us to develop, invest, uh, and perhaps even trade in the in the carbon credits, uh, linking back into the market mechanisms that are now being set up, like the Climate Impact X here in, in, in Singapore. 
Thank you for that. I'm going to just uh, move us on to a few questions, and I'll start with a list uh, that I have, and then hopefully take a few from the audience. So please do write in your questions. Uh, we can see them here, and I can then uh, pose them to, to the panel. Uh, Lian Pin, let me come back to you, because at the bottom of all of this is the science. Uh, we've heard about blue carbon, we've heard about green carbon, we've heard that blue carbon has more potential than green carbon. Talk to us a little about you know, what are the different sources of these nature-based carbon solutions, and especially in Southeast Asia, uh, what should we be prioritizing? Where should we be prioritizing? Thanks, thanks, Kavita, for that uh, excellent question. Um, may maybe I'll just make a slight correction uh, to say that uh, it's not necessarily true that blue carbon has more potential than green carbon. Uh, what is true is that um, for many blue carbon ecosystems, uh, such as mangroves they, and sea grasses, uh, they do have a higher rate of sequestration, of carbon sequestration, which means that on a per you know, unit area basis, uh, they do capture more carbon uh, than compared to a, a terrestrial uh, forest, uh, a rainforest, and so on. Um, and and uh, and coming back to your point about which uh, uh, ecosystems in our region we might want to put more attention on, uh, I would say that given that our region is uh, an archipelagic one, uh, we have a lots of islands and lots of coastlines, so it does make sense to put more attention on uh, on coastal ecosystems, including uh, blue carbon systems. Um, and that would deliver on two benefits uh, and help us address two main uh, goals. One is uh, climate change mitigation. Um, by investing in protecting or rehabilitating our blue carbon ecosystems, we would be able to uh, uh, continue to lock up the carbon stock uh, that, is, uh, that is within the vegetation of uh, these blue carbon ecosystems, or uh, grow new blue carbon systems, so re rehabilitate or regenerate uh, mangrove systems for us to capture uh, more carbon uh, from the atmosphere and lock them up. That's the first uh, deliverable. The second goal that uh, a focus on blue carbon systems will address is that they also help to uh, help us in terms of climate change adaptation. Now, uh, uh, given that we, again, we, we are a very archipelagic region, uh, many of the, the small island states uh, uh, in the region uh, do face uh, serious uh, uh, challenges of, of sea level rise, including Singapore. And there is great potential for us to um, explore ways of integrating both uh, green infrastructure, which are the, um, the uh, nature-based solutions, with uh, engineered solutions, which are the uh, uh, you know, technological solutions, for us to address uh, uh, these uh, sea level rise issues uh, in, uh, uh, in, in terms of climate change adaptation. But at the same time, we should not forget the, the, the green carbon systems as well, because uh, there are still lots of standing forests in, in the region across many parts of, uh, for example, Indonesia, Malaysia, and parts of Indo Burma. And as uh, my map uh, showed earlier, has shown earlier, um, a lot of these forests, uh, standing forests, are, are, are under threat. And uh, so there's a lot of scope for us to invest in protecting uh, these standing forests uh, in the terrestrial systems uh, to continue to uh, protect the carbon stocks and turn off that tap of uh, carbon emissions resulting from land use change. Thanks, Liam. I'm going to follow that up and then, then move to some of the others. We always worry about the additionality and the permanence of nature-based uh, based solution. I'd welcome any comments from the panel. And I think that's the critical one, right? So we can protect them, but how do we ensure additionality and permanence uh, on the ground? Any thoughts from you? Or uh, maybe then I'll turn to Ophelia and probably ask you, given your landscape approach as well. Lenpin, do you want to add to that first? Yeah. Um, Ophelia, go ahead. Thank you for the question. Yeah, how to make it sustainable uh, and additionality. Uh, honestly, um, i give you one example. Uh, today, it's still at, I would say it's still early stage and green has been around for about four years now and still uh, testing these, these tools, the, the landscape protection plan and the environmental and social. Um, but this, I think this is gaining ground. Uh, I think, you know, the, uh, the work that you're doing, a lot of the NGO work is, is doing 
and the financial sector and the corporate sector that is doing is not yet integrated. So with this blended finance approach, it's, it should be integrated. And if you want to uh, make this sustainable, blended finance ought to be a temporary measure. Uh, so, so, what, so, so that the financial sector, the, the, the mainstream financial sector to, to take, take over this, this space, the whole in fact investment, the whole institutional investor should, should uh, uh, you know, take the, the foreground. Um, but like I said, this is a testing ground, how to make it sustainable. Uh, we found some good models. And uh, as you know, um, we need to find the common measurements, which is probably, this is where it, it's still a, a challenge. Uh, ESG definition is still, uh, people have different, different definitions of ESG. So, but, but I am very encouraged to see that, that, that it's happening all over the world. There's a lot of groupings of corporations uh, and jumping on, on, this, on this trend. So um, if the private sector is not forging ahead, the market mechanism is not forging ahead, I think, uh, I, I, I think uh, this is very key in order to make it sustainable on the ground. Thank you. Um, Martin, I'm going to move to you exactly on this point and also take a question from the audience, which is how important is blended finance leveraging donor capital to de-risk for private investors uh, to increase capital flows towards NCS? So if you could take that in your comments as well. Sure. So on the permanence issue, um, many of the regulatory frameworks that endorse carbon offsets and nature-based solutions do provide mechanisms within them for permanence. So for example, Vera system has buffer systems. Um, the, 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 the other schemes that are around have, 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 have different programs. It's interesting, some legislative programs require the person who's protecting nature to look after permits for the first 10 years and then it transfers to the state. So there are different mechanisms that, that can be done. But ultimately it's about, it comes back to the issue of, of value and it comes back to the issue of, of long-term value creation. So if you look at, um, it, an interesting example is the Queensland government in Australia set up a fund called the Land Restoration Fund, and they called for tenders for people to undertake activities that would reduce carbon and create statutory carbon credits, but would also have other benefits. And so they paid individuals who would undertake activities to reduce carbon and paid for the carbon credits. And then on top of that, they would layer um, additional payments for things like watershed benefits, koala restoration habitat, and the like. And so ultimately, if you as a, as a country value watershed protection, koala habitat, you think these are important issues to fund, then the government has an, can either fund them themselves or it could pay the private sector to undertake these services with an ongoing r rental arrangement. It's ultimately a public good and it's public spending, but it, it comes down to the point as to, as to the mechanism used to fund it. So, um, so th that's an example of where there's, an there's a financial incentive to keep the permits going over a long period and you pay people every year. And there's been other good examples of that, e e particularly in the water area, where preserving watershed areas means that you have clean drinking water in reservoirs which then communities can, can fund through a tax on those who use the water. So using natural systems to do that. On, 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 the, blended, on the issue of blended finance, um, where we are at the moment, it is true that a lot of the large scale um, protection of nature is funded through philanthropy. And where we need to get to is to have it funded through, through the private sector as well. So philanthropy plays a very key role and organisations like TNC play a critical role in getting donor funding and applying those to the, the sort of excellent projects which Phil has talked about. But ultimately, if you want to get to 77 trillion, philanthropy will not do that. So we have to start putting in place the mechanisms that are going to drive capital into nature, which comes back to the whole valuation point. Thanks, Martin. I mean, and that's an excellent point of saying, how do we actually get investment into project development at the start? But I, I wanted to stick with you and ask one more question around measurement. Um, and, uh, and evaluation, because obviously you've been talking about saying that we're currently only measuring carbon, which is not easy either. Uh, but are you seeing investors looking at the additionality of the other nature benefits or people benefits and getting that into a decision criteria for investment, but also uh, as a impact that they have through these investments? 
Yeah, I think ultimately, if one offers an investment product and they are arguing that that investment product will provide good outcomes and good nature impacts, then you, the investors will expect to see how you measure those nature impacts. And the truth is, we're really at the, I would say, at the very nascent end of developing that. When we earlier this or early this year, last year, launched with HSBC, our Climate Asset Management Natural Capital Fund, we were probably approached by 40 people around the world who came to us and said, we have a tool to value natural capital. But when you actually went through all of those offerings, there were probably about four tools that we found that were actually able to measure natural capital variances over time. And it's difficult if you want to take um, a, um, a particular area and you want to measure a particular species in that area, it requires a lot of on-ground baselining, et cetera. So with areas like soil carbon, um, which is an interesting area at the moment, the, the default mechanism to measure soil carbon is by doing a tremendous amount of on-ground sampling. We are moving towards satellite imaging, being able to measure soil carbon content in the ground. That will significantly reduce the cost of, of measurement. And, it will, and, and if, the, if the data can be more accurate over time, it creates a, more, a greater and easier and more cost-effective ability to gather data that can help you measure natural capital impact. And so this then creates a more, more compelling investment proposition because you can see what, go, what goes on. So measurement's really important. Um, and I think, you know, we need to develop the tools. And I think there is a lot out there, a lot of really interesting technologies and ideas coming as to how to better do that. Thank you. Uh, Huoli, let me move to you because you're on the ground trying to develop these, these projects and it all kind of comes together from the science to the landscape approaches corporate, from the investment. What does it feel like? What are you seeing as the challenges that you have uh, to develop some of these projects? Uh, thank you, Kavita, for the very good question. So I think a challenge is quite a lot of challenge. So uh, I agree with uh, uh, Felia and Martin, uh, you mentioned, like uh, especially Felia, you, you mentioned it's still early stage. Although a lot of data science model is there, but it's really challenging us for us to work on ground and especially make the uh, business proposals to corporates. So we want to show them like, okay, uh, NCS project exciting, you know, it can help you to mitigate the carbon, especially, you know, uh, we're based in China. So the carbon is a very uh, critical indicators uh, as a driver, but, you know, corporates will ask, okay, what is the cost benefit? How much uh, of the investment, how much profit? I mean, the carbon credit or the other uh, relevant credit uh, in line with their sustainable uh, goals. Um, but it's very hard to give them the, the, you know, the answer in one minute because it's not that mature in comparison with the other engineering or tech uh, based solution. So uh, I want to echo uh, what has been mentioned by our uh, you know, by other speakers, lacking of uh, uh, cost, uh, robust uh, cost benefit data. Uh, so it's, you know, like uh, uh, makes currently the NCS program look less attractive uh, for the private to, you know, to invest in. So uh, at this moment, a lot of fund goes to the other uh, mitigation solutions. So if, you know, um, we are still exploring how to do this on ground. And secondly, uh, in terms of the sustainability, uh, lots of experts also mentioned. So how we make the project at least look more sustainable, we think uh, we have to respect the local knowledge. Uh, taking you know some of the project we are implementing in in Mongolia, uh, herdersmen is a local people and they have uh, uh, hundreds of years experience. But under the uh, background of climate change, how they you know uh, especially adapt to the change because they are not. Uh, that always not the heavy uh, pollution, uh, pollution uh, you know, like uh, release a lot of uh, carbon emission. So uh, we doing a survey and to understand the local practice so that to identify what is the best herders time uh, in order to tackle uh, the different risks under climate change. In the meanwhile, so uh, our team also have to determine the, what is a new crop so that can dealing with uh, uh, in the future the water shortage. So only with this kind of survey, you, the, the solutions will be used by local farmer and also local community government will say, 
the recommendation is make sense. So, but this is still quite, I have to say, quite challenging and early stage. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, and, th and thank you for sharing that experience from the ground. I think one of the outcomes that we want for nature-based solutions for climate is uh, essentially that local communities and indigenous peoples are part of that uh, decision-making of what kind of solutions, but also benefit from it. So it's really nice to hear about the engagement on the ground with the herders and the local communities in those solutions, and hopefully getting credit and uh, and incomes from the from the carbon that they are sequestering and saving as as, as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Lianpin. I'm going to move back to you because we have a couple of questions uh, that you know are difficult questions. So just to give you a heads up, uh, one is more about your opinion on nature-based solutions that is based on my biomimicry. Is this a way that we can provide future solutions? So I think this is. I mean, I'd le let you answer because this is going slightly away from nature, but more towards biomimicry in its um, in the in the science side. Any thoughts? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kavita. Um, I, I think when we talk about nature-based solutions, there is uh, a quite quite a diversity of, um, of of definitions or understanding of what we mean by nature-based solutions. Well, what we're talking about today mainly uh, revolves around the three baskets of solutions that you had uh, highlighted in your introductory slides and some of the other speakers have as well, which are the baskets of uh, protection, um, better management of our agricultural forestry, as well as um, reforestation of or restoration. But um, so, and, and these solutions are uh, targeted more at uh, addressing our climate change uh, uh, challenges. But, but there are other um, uh, understanding or definitions of nature-based solutions in other sectors, uh, including, uh, for example, uh, integrating uh, uh, you know, greenery or trees or, or, or forests in our built environment, in our urban landscape, and how that uh, you know, may, may potentially maybe not, not contribute that much to uh, carbon sequestration, but are still very important uh, aspects of, of uh, urban planning because they could potentially uh, contribute to a lowering of temperatures uh, by, by uh, reducing the, uh, the uh, amount of uh, uh, urban uh, uh, land cover in, in, the, in the landscape, as well as, of course, pro providing other co-benefits, such as um, you know, providing a space for the, the communities to, to, to unwind, to relax, uh, which is very important for ensuring our physical and mental well-being. Um, so definitely, um, uh, uh, I think uh, those kinds of nature-based solutions in regards to uh, biomimicry are very important and uh, should also be considered, especially in terms of uh, urban planning. Thank you. So more nature-inspired than probably nature-based and probably more towards the adaptation and resilience um, as, as well. Uh, so I'm going to stick with you, Lianpin, because there is an interesting example which talks to permanence, uh, and the question is more about how does uh, NCS tackle or value climate catastrophes, for example, the recent forest fires in California eroding carbon credits? What do we do when it all goes up in flames? Um, I, I think Matwain actually uh, addressed that question earlier in the sense that he mentioned uh, in, in most of the internationally recognized uh, carbon accounting standards or, or, or verification standards, there is a provision within those standards to set aside a requirement for project implementers and developers to set aside buffer credits uh, as a form of insurance uh, to, uh, to address exactly these kinds of, um, uh, of natural disasters. Uh, and, and not just uh, the loss of credits or stocks from fires, but also from um, illegal logging, for example, uh, from uh, tree diebacks uh, because of diseases and so on. So I think buffer uh, credits are uh, the sort of the, the default option uh, for, for addressing these, uh, these potential risks uh, uh, to the permanence of our uh, nature-based uh, carbon projects. Uh, but perhaps Martin, Martin has uh, other, other solutions uh, in mind or uh, that are being discussed there that he might be uh, better aware of. Martin? In, uh, I think um, you answered it very well. And I think, I mean, just to give you one example. So under the Australian government scheme, if you have a credit from forest and the forest burns, then there's a pause in the carbon. Until the stock's restored, you can't claim more credits. 
under VERA, there's a buffer approach. So, and under the International Carbon Accounting Frameworks, the, the UNFCCC, um, uh, there are, uh, again, they account for these natural disasters as, as natural variances. But yes, if you have a, if you do have a carbon credit, you've sold it, um, you are relying on the buffer in the event that, that there's, there's a natural disaster. Thank you. I think all of these are obviously still being determined in how you make some of these uh, projects work. Uh, and I think there was a mention of the task force for scaling voluntary carbon markets, and we're also looking at the voluntary carbon markets integrity initiative. So a number of initiatives now trying to put in place what core carbon principles are, what good demand looks like, and how do we further enhance supply. So all work in, work in progress. Uh, I'm actually yeah, going to... Yeah. Sorry. Yes, Martin, please. Just make one comment, which is that um, all of these issues are obviously challenging issues, but in the grand scheme of things, we don't have sufficient time uh, to really to make a perfect system. So in many ways, if we can protect large areas of natural capital or restore large mangrove areas or, or, or peatlands, et cetera, even if we're uncertain where they will be in 10 years' time, if we can guarantee protection for the next five years, that buys us time. And hopefully by then we'll be able to build the adequate systems and the valuation that people recognise their importance. And then it'll be then there's much, I would argue, there's less likelihood of that natural capital being removed or destroyed. So sometimes, you know, we can build, spend a lot of time building a perfect system, but I think we're better off trying to, to find ways to, to protect and fund our natural capital um, now and, and, and deal with these issues as we go. Yes, the whole question of whether we at least protect what we have so that we buy us some more time while trying to bring back what we've, what we've lost. It's an interesting debate that we could have there. Um, a really interesting question um, uh, from Cara, who's the British High Commissioner here. So we are 35 days from COP26, which has high hopes pinned on it. Uh, and there's a strong call to action on nature, consistent with the policy focus of COP26, and we're only 35 days away. Uh, what are the panelists' top hope for how COP can accelerate, mobilize investment in, in nature? So. Some of you may be going to COP, but, uh, and even if you're not, what would you want to see happen as an outcome from COP? So maybe I'll get all four of you to, to answer that, uh, maybe starting with, uh, with Philia. Uh, thank you for this question. Um, I, I think two things that, that I observe, uh, having uh, looked at it on the ground over the last four years, you know, there's a, a new professions emerging, um, environmental science, uh, you know, expertise on the ground, uh, facilitators, community organizers. These are, uh, th these are uh, professional skills that as a banker, I've, I've, I've not met before. So I think there's a whole, whole other um, multiplier effect that is quite positive. Uh, in, in this drive to find the right modeling. Uh, but uh, I would also like to uh, highlight this, that obviously Indonesia has a financing gap. Um, to, you know, to reach the 2030, if we're only financing it ourselves, it's like we, we are, we are, uh, lack, we are, the gap is about 40 to 50% uh, in order to, to be able to achieve the NDC target. So, but again, who's, uh, you spoke about the risk adjusted capital, but essentially what it is, is who's financing the transition cost? This has not been factored into the pricing. Yes, and, and, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's a matter of, you know, uh, more robust policies, uh, commitments from the private sector, from the willing partners, uh, um, all this drive. And we've been talking a lot about the supply side, but also the drive from the demand side is also important. For example, I mean, you know, Palm oil, for example, we've uh, received, and Indonesia obviously is re Malaysia also received a lot of criticism, but you know, at the end of the day, there's also the buyer, the large consumer growth forum. I mean, I think, um, I think this, there has to be, uh, you know, jointly both the supply and the demand side to work together towards, towards this. So um, for now, the transition cost is now financed by the public funds. But I, I'm not sure that is going to uh, be achieved at scale if we want to achieve the 2030. So really, 
uh, speeding up the, the, the integration of both the public and the private finance. Thank you, Philia. We're going to run out of time. We have a minute and a half, so I'm going to do a quick comment from everyone. Uh, what was your hope for COP, uh, COP26, Huali? Thank you, Carita. Uh, for COP26, I see um, that we need actions, not only uh, too much. currently, you know, here uh, in China, so our country made a great determination on to, re uh, to reach carbon neutrality, uh, which is great, very encouraging. But also the, the sad effect is like everyone looks too much on the contribution from NCS for carbon sequestration. They forgot the resilience risk. So I think, you know, uh, if we want to scaling up the NCS, so uh, how their contribution <laughs> to risk reduction or uh, biodiversity loss. So this is a very emerging uh, topic so that uh, can make them more attractive to business. Thank so you. this is my wish. Thank you. Thank you. Martin, quick comment for COP26. Yeah, I think the most important thing is that we resolve Article 6 and the corresponding adjustment issue, and we understand how that interacts with NDCs, because that will unlock a large amount of carbon finance. Um, I think, secondly, we need a resolution on how high forest, low deforestation countries are rewarded for their activities. I think there's a live debate on that. Um, and I think those two issues will make a significant difference. I don't think more statements on the need to finance nature will help. We have plenty of those. We just need to, to, to put in place the practical tools that will enable it to happen. Thank you. And the last word to you, Lian Bin. Yeah, thanks, Kavita. So I think my last word is uh, probably uh, not, not specific to the COP26 question, but uh, more more generally uh, pertaining to nature-based carbon uh, offsets in general. Um, so I, I think uh, this is one point that we haven't really touched on. Uh, I think at the same time that we are uh, seeking these very high-quality nature-based carbon offsets, uh, from our region and, and elsewhere, we also need to ensure that these offsets are not being used for corporate greenwashing. Um, I think it, it, is, it would be very tempting for big businesses, um, especially those without a sound plan or policy for transitioning to a low carbon economy to uh, simply buy up carbon credits in, a, in an attempt to uh, reduce their net carbon footprint. Um, that could lead to, the, of course, the perverse outcome of no real climate mitigation benefit. And, and I think carbon trading platforms such as uh, CIX in Singapore uh, has the potential to act as a gatekeeper, not only uh, of where the carbon is coming from, but also who these carbon offsets are being sold to. And I think holding both the sellers and buyers of carbon offsets to the highest standards is critical for realizing the potential of nature-based carbon projects for real emission, uh, emissions reduction and removals. Thank you, Lian Bin. Could not have said it better. So I'm going to take uh, just a second to, to wrap up, uh, not repeat what people have said, but just to say that there is a very real opportunity for nature-based solutions to be part of the broader climate solution, especially here in Southeast Asia, because of our natural environment, our tropical forests, our coastlines, the blue carbon potential that we have. We all need to get more investment into these solutions to project develop for it, to ensure permanence and additionality, uh, to measure the impacts on nature and people as, as well. We do look to high quality and high integrity demand uh, as well, and hopefully CIX will help that. So we're not looking at greenwashing. We're not looking at uh, letting companies off the hook. And last but not the least, we need better regulation and we need more investment into some of these solutions so that we can uh, take the full benefit and the outcomes that these uh, promise us. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap us uh, up on this panel and say a big thank you to our four speakers for joining us virtually uh, and hand you back to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kavita, for joining us through the conversation.